Well, we are glad to know that you're still there and watching The Breakfast with us. It's time to go to the press and see what made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies. We are glad to be joined by Mr. Chris Kainde Wandu, a chartered arbitrator in the UK. Uh, good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Joining you from Lagos here. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> we know that you have not jackpot. <laughs> we thank, we're, we're thankful about that. We're beginning with the Punch newspaper this morning. Um, Dangote Fuel, that's the leading headline. Marketers fear high-priced petrol ahead of supply. And we have some riders to that story. Uh, crude price will determine cost of Dangote PMS. Dapman, Ipman won federal government. And then imported crude makes production cost higher may affect petrol price. That is Dangote, a source from Dangote. Your comment, sir. Yes, uh, you know, the mistake most Nigerians uh, made, or were made to believe is that once Dangote uh, petroleum goes uh, into operation, um, that um, prices of petroleum products are going to drop, as it were. And I've always said, I've you know, been very, very cautious on that myself. That, um, there are going to be so many indices to be able to um, allude to what will happen with the Dangote Refinery Act. But as we have seen, you see that a lot of the Dangote Refinery is facing a lot of challenges, both locally and internationally. And um, for a start, you can see that um, they are not getting the necessary raw materials which they need, which is the crude oil. Um, crude is not available, which has made Dangote to resort to importing crude oil from uh, other countries of the world, including the United States of America. That in itself is going to cause a lot of challenge. And Dangote has come up, raised an eyebrow that it's having a serious problem and uh, not having the necessary uh, um, products uh, to work with. Secondly, is also the problem uh, with the regulatory uh, authority, as it were, and uh, which Dangote have also um, accused of sabotaging is able by giving out licenses to some local importers to import um, products um, that are, which has put also its um, company at a, at a risk. It went as far as saying that um, some of those products were adulterated, uh, an accusation of the regulatory agency. I bet um, the fact means that marketers are saying that the prices of uh, the price of Dangote uh, products may be higher than um, the, the ones even being imported because, according to some of the reports we read, um, Dangote says it's getting its crude oil about five uh, five dollars over and above the, the the price of crude in Nigeria. So, and I ask myself, why is it that we cannot be able to get Dangote crude to be able to operate a country that's supposed to be uh, one of the largest exporter of crude oil in the world, the member of OPEC, is finding it difficult to repair, to feed its refinery. And you ask yourself, which kind of country are you? That means that some people are out to sabotage this effort. Some people are so happy that we've been importing petroleum products for the, how many years because of what they benefit from it. Even the local refineries, the one the Potaco that have been promised that will become on stream by January or December last year. The point we are getting again now is that they are moving into December. So we are at their mercy. But my challenge and what I continue to say is that anything that happens within the petroleum sector, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Bentinibu will be held responsible because he is the minister of petroleum, petroleum. Not even the minister of food. He is that means he signed off on every issue and um consigned a so. I hope they resolve this issue as quickly as possible because Nigeria also has a 25% stake in the Angota refineries. The more reason why we should be able to make that. But the news that is coming out uh, is not palatable, and that is how we do business in Nigeria. Well, it's not the federal government sabotaging it. It's, it should be some individuals from stories that we are hearing. The annoying thing is that sometimes we know that uh, the federal government with all the intelligence has the list of these people who are doing what 
in Nigeria and they don't seem to be able to clip their wings and we wonder why that keeps happening all the time. But we, we from the stable, so, so to speak, of the Minister of Works, uh, Dave Umahi, federal government revokes 870 billion road contracts, 2,270 projects suffer delay. Uh, just this morning we were talking about the fact that he said there will be no more um, variations on price that are paid to contractors because uh, some contractors delay the work that they're supposed to do and take it to a longer time so that they will get more money from a contract that should have been finished on time and all that. But right now we have a story of 870 billion naira road contracts and 2,270 uh, uh, projects suffer delay. What do you think? Yes, if, in as much as I have my own uh, reservation of the fact that some of the projects being embarked by the stop works, um, I have my own personal reservation um, because we have a lot, a large chunk of um, problem on our roads currently. And um, I believe that some of those resources that we have depleted, if channeled to making sure that all those abandoned projects or most of the goods that are conditions in Nigeria are worked on and uh, are motoring, then after that, we can now start thinking about uh, opening up or new uh, avenues of construction. But I totally agree with him. I like the way Amana is doing about this issue of contract. The average contractor uh, that works in Nigeria is a very cunning um, contractor. Uh, they are very selfish. They are just like our politicians. We cannot trust them. They collect mobilization fee, disappear, and um, travel to all parts of the world with their wives, girlfriends, and best part of them, and, left, and leave the job undone. So the minister had warned uh, a few weeks ago that most of these contractors who have refused to uh, come back to site or return to site to have their contract. So uh, one of the major ones, I think, is the one, in, the, the, one of the major routes uh, have been revoked. And um, about three other contractors have been blacklisted. I saw on the front page of one of the newspapers, I think it's daily trust. Mm -hmm. We are the Federal Minister of Works. Um, I put that an advertisement for some of those roads, and I think that is the way to go. If those contractors know that if they are not able to perform that the contract, they will sit up. It's not just revoking the contract. We should also make sure that we send the draft agencies like EFCS or the Nigerian Police uh, Fraud Unit to go after them and make sure that the money of Nigerians that were paid to them for jobs that were not done are recovered from. Or else, we seize up them their assets and property assets. So I totally, um, I totally back the action of the minister of works, and I hope that in the years to, in the months to come, we see a lot of this. Go and check out the um, the that road. Uh, that is it, Patani Road. I've forgotten that. What they call that road? That water court. That long stretch of road on South South that's supposed to have been completed for how many years now? Till now. That road has remained on motorway, despite billions, not even billions, trillions and trillions of naira that have been expanded. The only measurable impact you can see is on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Uh, I was on that route yesterday and I was shocked by the level of work that has been done on that. And if you if you are driving from Lagos, you don't have any challenges in the Bega as it and the, and that and that long bridge. Uh, you can be rest assured that you can hit Ibadan within one hour. That was something that has not been done, we cannot experience in the past. So if we're able to extend this kind of um, this thing to other roads like the Shagamu Bini Express with some portion of that road. I was in I was in Shagamu, Mara Shagamu yesterday, and I still realized that some portion of that road is still bad. But if we can be able to extend the kind of volume of work we've done on the Lagos Ibad Expressway to other parts, including the Enugu Potako Express, then we are home and dry. Um, but as I said, I'm totally in sync with the Minister of War, and uh, I think we should be able to encourage him. Okay, uh, a worrisome headline here, a small one there, is Customs sees uh, 18 billion naira firearms, drugs uh, from Turkey recover 844 rifles. When I saw this, it, my heart just skipped. And that is what has been discovered. I'm sure there are others that have been able to pass without the discovery of the, the, the Navy of the, or any other relevant body at the, at the seaports? Yes, as a journalist, uh, I have privy information about that. Uh, 
that recovery. It doesn't they didn't happen just this. I think it happened about two weeks ago. Maybe it happened. Mm. I was uh, aware of it and um, I was just waiting for formal information from the from the customs and the Nigerian police and very bad agencies. And that yesterday the uh, CG of Comsom was able to pre pre press men. Yes, eight hundred and forty four um, assault rifles. That is itself is enough to equip an army. And um, we we are sitting on a serious gap powder, uh, yes, gunpowder, as it were. Um, I will, we are having serious security challenges. You can imagine, and I've only said it time and time in for one of the, if we have a report of that kind of seizure, one report, you can rest assured that about 10 of other consignments must have made their way into the market with that. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you understand what I mean, so so many would have passed through before they could discover that either in the past or in the, so that is uh, is um, what we need to do is that what I want to hear not just display the the blue on me. What I want to see is those behind the that importation. Who are they mm -hmm. and what purpose are they serving? Those are the ones that I, I, the next thing I want to hear from the custom CG is that. The masterminds, not the small boys that are just um, carry the thing. The masterminds, those behind those partitions, should be arrested and paraded and let's see them. And they give us this. And that is just only part in Porta Court. You can imagine what was happening in other courts, Lagos, or through all the um, uh, the border line that our border, which is one of the most poorest in the world. What have been, what could have been coming in? We are having serious uh, security challenges. And you could see what happened in Bonnie a few days ago. We are, um, Boko Haram since have uh, started real, maybe enacting what they are used to, which is to serve bombing and close to about 30 people were killed in, yeah. in uh, 32 in now. Yes. Yes, about 32 now. And we are told that there were 30 suicide, female suicide bombers. It's only four uh, that were able to uh, detonate their um, bombs, and about two were arrested. You ask yourself what happened to the other 24. Twenty-four women, allegedly, who are somewhere uh, looking around, are ready to unleash terror. So um, our security agencies should put their antics as far as I'm concerned. But most importantly, is that we need to do, need to do a lot of intel, intelligence, as I've always said. Uh, intelligence matters. Just having um, security agencies to be put on ground, um, having guns and uh, Air power, superior air power, whatever we call it, does not serve you. You have to have the necessary intelligence. And intelligence comes from the people. You have to be some level of confidence with the people so that they can be able to give the relevant information. Because these people live among them, so they know them. If they are sure that whatever information they give you will not be traced back to them or will not be used against them by these terrorists or bandits or whoever they are, then they will be able to volunteer. So we need to be that confidence with these security agencies and the people within these communities so that they can volunteer. With that information, that's practically nothing the security agencies can do. Mm. Okay, before we move to another um, uh, newspaper, INEC lacks power to conduct local government elections. That's according to Yakubu, the INEC chairman. Of course, the, the, uh, INEC doesn't have that power. That power has been given to the state uh, independent electoral commissions and is, is for their power uh, to conduct that. Yes, yeah, there are businesses, I think there are businesses in recent time where they have been called for INEC to take over those responsibilities. But the question I ask, the one that would give INEC, have they been able to really have they been able to do a good job? The, we saw what happened in the 2023 um, general election and how INEC failed woefully. I say woefully, uh, irrespective of whatever anybody said. We saw what happened during the presidential election. We saw what happened during the transmission of results. We saw what happened during the uh, National Assembly governorship. If you see the number of uh, court cases that we had after that election, then you have to give INEC a thumb down. So, um, it's showing, they, giving them more responsibility to conduct local government um, uh, elections, it be more tax for them. But the fact is that the, the look, um, state independent uh, election uh, commission has been presently. Um, constituted only are just under the capacities of the governors of the state who maneuver who manipulate it to be able to achieve their personal ends. They will they have a local government that's supposed to be independent, but you see that currently they are still fighting for an autonomy and also financial autonomy, which is why 
That case has been taken to the Supreme Court by the AGF for interpretation. Um, I would think that INEC should be left with the responsibility of conducting national assembly, where we find a more uh, better way of making sure that election within the grassroots, which is local government, is properly conducted um, by the relevant uh, agency space. As it is, yes, I know that you find it very difficult to see any local government election in this state. We are the ruling party in that state uh, won't win 100% um, of the of the election as it were, except for one or two cases. We are just for whatever reason just give the opposition one or two seats. But that is how we rule. But as I need rightly said, for now, they don't have the power to conduct such election. Okay, uh, well. Um, 2024 Hajj, how federal government eight states splashed 100.6 uh, billion naira on pilgrims. Well, that is on the uh, Vanguard you are, newspaper. You are talking about states. What are the federal government? Yeah, federal government and states combined splashed 100.6 billion, yes, not million. Government that is provided almost 90 billion to that, and I ask you as a Western, what is our business with uh, any going on Hajj or going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem? That is a personal, <laughs> that is your personal uh, undertaking mm. between you and your God. So why would the government be involved in that? If you cannot afford this, then stay home. But you can afford it, then do. It has nothing to do with uh, with God. We shouldn't have anything to do with government. So you know, we are more uh, we are more pious than the Pope, and the way we behave. Uh, when it comes to the issue of religion in this country. That is what where we find ourselves. And our leaders take advantage of that. But that is why you say an African Nigerian, everything happened within within God that is say, God will do him. God will do him. God will do Why you believe in God will do him? Other countries are taking the destiny in their hands. You saw what happened in Kenya. Mm. They didn't wait for God to do him. You saw how the youth came out and be able to march the government and be able to get that uh, obnoxious law uh, reviewed. Um, and it was stepped down. Uh, by the government. So that is how to go. China, most developed countries don't look at God to do it. If they don't. China, America, United Kingdom, even Russia, and other developed countries. If you come to work, God to do it. No. So, but the uh, problem with that is the fact that there have been serious allegations of um, fraud, allegedly, um, that was made against the uh, National Health Commission by the, I think, the Zanfara State Governor. On the way and manner um, the money released for Hajj uh, was utilized, and he has called for a proof. I've not heard anything from the federal government to, to that effect. Mm -hmm. But I think that we should just stop all these shenanigans of wasting money on people who have decided to go and have communion with their God. It has nothing to do with us. Religion is a personalist. Uh, as a in Christianity, we say that once you die, you will personally face your God uh, for whatever sins you committed of you. No government is going to follow you to go and meet God and uh, be able to uh, ask as an advocate for you. So religion is a personal issue. I should be left at that level. Okay. Uh, let's take a final one since we've run out of time. Court orders release of man after 15 years in prison without charge or trial. I, we spoke about this in our top trending issues. But as a, a, a lawyer as well, a, a legal person, um, 15 years in prison, how does that even happen without, without trial at all? You know, in law, we always say that it's, it's better to allow uh, 99 people who are not too sure of um, the accusation against them to go free rather than and we not send one single soul to any place. But that is what happens. It's not just in Nigeria. You've seen, you've seen even the United States of America and most countries. There are instances where people have been allegedly incarcerated for, uh, for what they did not commit. Um, and that is what happened. But it's part of our legal system because our legal system has become so, I don't know how to put it, um, intrigued that most people can hardly find, uh, can hardly get it done as quickly as possible. That is why if you go to the prisons, close to 60 to 70 percent of those uh, in our various prisons across the are those that are awaiting trial. Or even flimsy excuses. Some of them have been granted bail. And they cannot even pay a 5,000 euro to put their bill and leave the prison, you know. So um, that is what is happening. So it's quite unfortunate for her. Um, but it's good that the person finally gets again his freedom. If it's other part of the world, what we have done now is to sue those or sue the government for putting him behind bars for that. Um, it is his fundamental human rights that was mm -hmm. printed upon 
and it has the right to be able to challenge such infrastructure. Um, but it is not it is not just within Nigeria. But my own personal opinion is that we can accelerate our judicial uh, system in order to make sure that people with minor offenses are allowed to just with just the space and just give the necessary care and judgments as quickly as possible. You just see somebody that was picked up for for strolling in the night or whatever, and he's incarcerated and he's in prison for 15, 20 years just because of our judicial system, because that issue cannot be ironed out as quickly as possible. Let us deal with the issue of awaiting trial in our period, which is why we're having a lot of jail breaks these days. Because a lot of people that are there are not supposed to be there. And our system has got so bad that when you put somebody in, in, in jail awaiting trial, some of them get emboldened and even join worse gangs mm -hmm. within the prison system. And when they come back, there are instances where you see people form armed robbery camps just because they were, they were in prison. I'm sure you must have seen mm -hmm. that. So our, the judicial system they really, really need to be standing. But the question you ask yourself, how many judges do we have to be able to get that for the number of people that are sent to the court on a daily basis? Okay, well, um, this is where we'll wrap it up on the, of the press this morning. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Nwandu, for coming on the show this morning. Thank you very much for having me on. Have a wonderful day too. We've been talking with Mr. Chris Kindewandu, a chartered arbitrator in the UK. He spoke to us from Lagos State here. And we're going to take a short break and return with our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>